Alberta is back to its blue roots. Last night, Jason Kenney and the United Conservative Party swept to majority power in the province, toppling the NDP's first ever government. And Kenney's sights are squarely set on who he sees as foes of the oil patch. Albertans have decided that we will no longer passively accept the campaign of defamation against the industry that has helped to create one of the most prosperous and generous societies on earth. While some advanced voting results are still being counted, here's a look at the big picture. A wave of Tory blue has replaced the NDP's orange crush from 2015. The UCP took three seats from NDP cabinet ministers, but see those circles? That's where the NDP held firm. In Edmonton, Rachel Notley keeps her seat and becomes leader of the opposition. The rest of the capital also remains largely orange, but it's a very different picture in Calgary. Voters in the province's largest city all but kicked the NDP from its borders. I will make sure that our vision of Alberta endures through a rigorous and robust opposition holding government to account again? and making sure that voices of all Albertans are heard in their legislature. This isn't just a victory for the UCP. Last night's results mean the federal Conservatives won themselves another ally in the fight against the national carbon tax, a block of opposition that now represents more than half the country's population. Any moment, Premier-designate Jason Kenney is expected to speak, and we'll take that live and bring that to you, of course, as soon as it happens. But first, we want to get reaction to the big vote in Calgary. We are joined, I think he's ready, yeah, William Macbeth is there, Principal with Canadians for Democracy and Prosperity. In Edmonton, Cheryl Oates, a senior advisor for NDP leader Rachel Notley, and next to her, Najib Jutt, a political strategist with Statecraft Partners. Hi, everybody. It's very nice to see you. I appreciate your time uh, today, About just about 24 four hours after the big vote. William, I've got to start with you. Uh, Jason Kenney, of course, came away with a big win last night. Uh, let's just go around. I want to get everyone's initial reaction to the outcome. Well, I think it's it's hard to, uh, you know, overstate how big of a change this actually was. The New Democrats went in with a strong majority government and they were relegated to opposition. I think the other big story, though, from election night has to be the sheer size of voter turnout. We're looking at about 70% mm -hmm. of eligible voters voting. And that sends the message that Albertans clearly wanted change, that they overwhelmingly wanted change, and they saw that Jason Kenney was the change that they wanted for our province. What about you, Cheryl? Was there, I mean, I know in the moments leading up to, to the night, there's obviously a lot of hope. The polls had been pointing in this direction. Was there any surprise on your part? Well, I will say among all of our staff and our candidates, the feeling today is just intense pride for the campaign that we've run, for the volunteers that we had uh, here in our headquarters in Edmonton, as well as in Calgary and across the province, and for the candidates who put their name on the ballot, whether they were successful or whether they weren't. Um, we are, in, are incredibly proud of the campaign that we've run. And today in this province, the NDP, the party itself, and the movement is stronger than it ever has been. Okay, I take your point that it, I, I remember when I worked there uh, back in the day uh, in 2010, there were four MLAs and a lot of people were asking yesterday, does this mean it's the end of the NDP? And I was saying, well, compared to then, this is this is <laughs> definitely a substantial increase. But it is a it is a loss. It is, you know, you're, you're no longer in government. If you were to mm -hmm. pinpoint something uh, that you think went wrong, what would it be? You know what, I, there isn't something I would put my finger on. Like I said, we're, we're super proud of our campaign. As you know, we were a really, really scrappy four-person opposition, and we will be a force to be reckoned with as opposition um, in this legislature going forward. So there's nothing in this campaign that we would change. There's not a pinpoint that we would put our finger on to say that something went wrong there. Like I said, really proud of all the work that we've done. Najib, if you're explaining what happened last night to people sitting outside of Alberta right now, how would you explain it? I would say that it's a, a case of authenticity and messaging. I think Jason Kenney came across, uh, he knew what the message was, what would appeal to the masses at this time, and that's the message that he, he carried across the province wherever he went. Uh, I think with the NDP that maybe they could have looked at uh, the messaging a little bit and, and changed it up a little bit earlier than they did, uh, eased off a bit on the negative campaigning and focused a little bit more on the economy, which is what uh, all the polls were saying. And just a reminder to our viewers, if you're joining us now, uh, we're back in Ottawa, but we are following the outcome of the Alberta election, and we're waiting any moment for Jason Kenney to address reporters for the first time since that win last night. William, uh, let me ask you about what we what we should expect from uh, you know a quote unquote Premier Kenney. Uh, the rhetoric during the campaign, especially directed towards Ottawa, directed towards foes of the oil patch, if you want to call them that, uh, was was certainly uh, strong and pointed. Uh, do you think there'll be any sort of uh, uh, you know calming? 
timing of that after once once Mr. Kenny assumes the role? I, you know, I think Jason Kenney um, wanted to see Alberta chart a new course when it came to the building of pipelines and getting our natural resources to market. Um, I, I think that Premier Notley, one of the reasons why Albertans chose a new government last night was they believed that Premier Notley hadn't fought hard enough, hadn't done enough, hadn't pushed back enough on some of these pipeline and energy related issues. So I think for Jason Kenney, you are going to see a, a different approach. You're also going to see, I think, uh, really quite rapid action right off the bat. I think he has yeah, what a do you lot mean? of what, what should we be watching for? Oh, well, I think, you know, he's already talked about the fact that we are going to take a harder bargaining position with the B.C. government when it comes to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. If we continue to see opposition from the government, we want to have the ability to uh, apply pressure in a very real way, and that's the so-called turn off the taps legislation. Uh, you're going to see the repeal of the carbon tax. We were told time and time again that carbon tax would get us a pipeline built. The fact is, it didn't. So I think that's another thing you're going to see right off the bat. And I also think you're going to see try, uh, what Jason's talked about, that um, partnership with First Nations communities who want to see energy development, getting that going, because there are a lot of First Nations groups right across Alberta and in British Columbia who do support energy development, and we want to work with them in order to get our resources to to, uh, to foreign markets. Cheryl, what do you think of that, that contention that, uh, that Premier Notley didn't fight hard enough? I think that Premier Notley fought every single day for jobs and for pipelines. Um, it's a very different approach, though. She she did it in a way that was aligned with the facts and aligned with the, the outcomes that were possible, and she aligned it with a way that, that actually did get results. And no question, Alberta has gone through a, a tough, tough economic downturn largely in part to the international price of oil dropping in an unprecedented way. But we have been there every step of the way. And you heard her on every single day of this campaign talk about jobs, talk about diversification, talk about the economy, talk about getting a pipeline built. And when we see um, the kind of things that Jason Kenney's putting on the table here, um, the results that he's looking for, he just might not be able to get. Like, for example, Bill 12 is something that, you know, it's a bill that our government uh, Past, but we were very, very strategic about Bill 12, how it would be deployed and when it would be proclaimed. And grandstanding and deploying the weapon on the launching pad is not going to make any difference in terms of the uh, pressure that might come from British Columbia. Najib, if the if the NDP, if that was Rachel Notley and the NDP's message throughout the campaign, there was also a, a, a corresponding message from the UCP, like Williams said, that they they wanted to achieve the same things but via different means or a different approach. Why do you think, or do you think, one, to what degree did one resonate over the other, and why? Well, I think one resonated with, uh, over the other because there was like a singular focus on it by Mr. Kenny. Also, too, sometimes, you know, the electorate just wants change for the sake of change, right? They, I think in their feeling it was that we gave uh, the NDP a ch uh, chance, pipelines weren't built, the economy is sluggish. And, I mean, I don't, I'm not arguing that, you know, some of these things were way beyond the control of the NDP. But, you know, sometimes people are just saying, well, let's try something else and see if we can get it done that way. And Mr. Kenny did a great job of, of having a lot of tough talk, a lot of rhetoric. You know, he's got a big to-do list. And, you know, sometimes it's easy to, to criticize from the sidelines. But let's see now what happens. I think I agree that he's going to immediately repeal the carbon tax, reduce corporate taxes. Uh, repeal the uh, farmers insurance these kinds of things that he's promised that he can get done quickly in his first hundred days and his summer of uh, repeal but then the bigger more complex issues are the ones that mire you down right health care education these big issues that every premier realizes aren't that simple quickly can I get your your take uh, Najib on the turnout I mean it's not a final number but it looks like uh, it's upwards of 70 percent which would be pretty I think the last time something even came close was 1971 if I'm if I'm correct what do, what do you make of that number I think it shows that we have an engaged le electorate. I think that we have a province that's urbanizing quickly, and I think that some of maybe the redistribution that the NDP, NDP did uh, benefited that as well. But uh, you know what? I think this is a perfect case for the smaller parties, including the NDP, to start looking at electoral reform. You know, it's first past the post is not the way to deal with urbanizing communities. Uh, and it's also, you know, things like online voting. I mean, we showed in the advanced voting, the easier you make it for people to vote, the more likely they are to come out. Especially if you think your target is that young urban voter, you better make it easy for them. William, can you talk a bit about the implications here at the federal level? Uh, obviously, we've been talking about the rhetoric, this idea of fighting. Uh, much of that rhetoric was directed towards the federal government. Do you think, uh, what, what do you think the relationship will be like? Uh, we're, we're hearing that, for example, there was a call between Jason Kenney and Justin Trudeau today. How do you, do you think that the, the relationship will be as fractious as it appeared to be during the campaign? 
I, you know, I think Albertans are really desperate to see our province turn the corner economically. We have so many unemployed, tens of thousands of unemployed Albertans, uh, an economy mired in uh, in slow growth, businesses closing their doors. We're, Albertans are really looking for someone who is going to really get our province going again. And that does involve maybe changing Alberta's relationship with the federal government. We have seen a tremendous lack of support from the Justin Trudeau Liberals when it comes to Alberta energy. They have passed a series of bills that would make it virtually impossible to build new pipelines in this in this. What, what are you passed. speaking of spe specifically? Bill C-69? Because that's just... Yeah, exactly. Bill C-69 and C-48, which directly target Alberta's energy sector. That's the only reason that uh, these pieces of legislation have come forward. You're seeing some liberals say, now try and backtrack on it, but the fact is, while these pieces of legislation were going through the House of Commons, these hurtful pieces of legislation, Rachel Notley really didn't protest at the at the early stages when we may have been able to get them I mean, changed she did, or stopped. She, she did go before the Senate. And like I remember interviewing her when she was here, fighting uh, fighting Bill C-69, and right. I think during the campaign she was fighting the tanker bill too, right? Absolutely, but that was when they're before the Senate. These bills originated in the Commons, and that meant there was an entire political process that could have been brought into action had the government of Alberta been focused on trying to protect Alberta's most important sectors. And I think one of the reasons why Albertans voted for change in such overwhelming numbers is they said, we want a government that will stand up for our energy sector and push back against a federal government that has frankly been a threat to our most important industry. Do you think, Cheryl, that the, the federal government was a threat to the oil patch? I think that there was some serious and credible concerns with the legislation uh, that William just raised in C69 and C48, and we did. I mean, since those since those bills came into the House of Commons, we have, in many different mediums, talked about the issues that they would cause for Alberta and Alberta's industry. Um, and although all of it wasn't as public, we have fought every step of the way for Alberta's industry. And you saw it in the end when we had an opportunity to speak before the Senate committee. Um, like, I appreciate that Mr. Kenny would like to refight the battles that he lost on the federal stage, but an Alberta government can only do so much, and we can we, we need to talk about outcomes rather than Twitter and uh, grandstanding tactics and not everything that they're proposing will have good outcomes for Alberta jobs and Alberta workers. Najib, final word to you. What do you think the relationship between the Alberta government and the federal government is going to be like? Listen, we have a premier designate that spent time in federal politics. He was a minister. He knows how it works. Uh, I, you know, he heard a speech yesterday. It sounded awfully a lot like a federal uh, election campaign speech. Uh, and I think what he's doing is he's setting himself up as a proxy in the case of a, a Andrew Scheer government in the fall. I think he's going to continue the tough talk because he knows that works uh, with the with the electorate and with the voters. But uh, you know, he knows that behind closed doors. In the meantime, he has to work with the government that we have, which is a federal liberal government. Alberta's heated election ended with a historic result last night. Rachel Notley's NDP government became the first one-term government in the province's history, replacing her, Jason Kenney, and the United Conservative Party. What was their path to victory? And did the polls predict this kind of landslide victory? To dig into the results, I'm joined by CBC Polls analyst Eric Grenier. Hi, Eric. Hi. Great to see you once again yes. throughout this campaign. So let's break down what happened last night. Well, as you said, the UCP did win and un uh, unseated the NDP, first first term government, because there have only been a few governments in Alberta's history. But let's look at the numbers overall, what happened in that race. So the UCP had a pretty big, uh, significant victory of 55% of the vote. The NDP was at 32%, which is still the second best they've ever done in their history. It's just kind of a disappointing uh, second place, uh, second result for them. The Alberta Party at 9%, the Liberals only 1%, and the seats right now, it's 63 to 24. And we're still waiting for some of those votes to be counted, those vote anywhere ballots, so it might not be until later this week until we know the final, final numbers, but right now that's what it looks like, and it's a big win for the UCP. And what about, what was the, what was the path to victory for them? I mean, we had talked about it, yeah. we had talked about Calgary, their vote efficiency, which clearly was, was there. What, what ended up er, happening? It was really the same path that the PCs always had. When the outlying regions of the of the province, rural areas, the small cities, and win Calgary. Those two regions enough were, were there to give them a majority government. They didn't need to win a single seat in Edmonton to get that majority. Let's look at the breakdown regionally, which kind of paints the portrait of why the UCP was able to uh, win this kind of victory. They won in Calgary very handily, 55% to 32%, more or less replicating the province as a whole. In the rest of Alberta, outside Edmonton and Calgary, they had a big, big win there, 67 to 21%. They just all more, more or less swept the region. The only seat the NDP won was in Lethbridge. But in Edmonton, the NDP still held on to their vote. They had 47%. They beat the UCP and won uh, 20 seats in the greater Edmonton area. Uh, so most of their seats 
did come from Edmonton, as was expected. You can see, though, that it was really Calgary and uh, the rest of Alberta that delivered the UCP that majority government. You were obviously tracking the polls throughout the entire campaign. How did the actual results stack up to them? It looks, by my guess, it looks like they were kind of under underestimating a bit of the popular vote, but the seats yeah. seem bang on. Yeah, that's exactly it. So for a lot of people, I don't think there were a lot of surprises because the polls right. were pro uh, projecting that the UCP would win a majority government, would win in Calgary, would win in the rural areas. So the overall picture is more or less what the polls are showing. But the actual results were not that close because uh, going into Election Day, the polls were suggesting a, a gap of about 10 to 11 points between the UCP and the NDP. In the end, the UCP won by 23 points. So that is not a very good result. If it had gone the other way, the NDP might have actually won. So when you're talking about that kind of error, right. it can have a big impact. Uh, what seems to be behind it? Mm -hmm. First of all, we'll have to see what those final results will be by the end of the week. Maybe the uh, those advanced votes are going to go one way or another, so we don't know exactly how big that error will be. But it also seemed to be in places that didn't really change the seat portrait. So you're looking at, when you look at those, uh, the rest of Alberta numbers, it was not supposed to be, that was the biggest swing, about a 20 point swing between where the polls were mm. and where the actual results were. So it does seem like they padded their lead there and that was one of the reasons why we saw that the UCP had a bigger uh, popular vote victory than the polls were suggesting would be the case. You mentioned those uh, advanced vote numbers, which won't be tallied really for a final count until the end of the week. Still, it looks like the, the turnout for this election could be close to 70 percent, which is one of the highest turnouts in Alberta in decades. In fact, Alberta's kind of known for low vo voter turnout. How significant do you think that was? I think it's very significant. It suggests that this was seen as, a, as an important election, as, as a more competitive election than there's been in Alberta. Alberta for a while, which is maybe why turnout has historically been so low. Uh, and historically as well, when turnout has been higher, it's been bad for the incumbent government, that it, there's a desire for change. And it does seem when you see the results that that was the case here, that a lot of people wanted to go out and vote out the NDP government. And that's what helped the UCP win a bigger a bigger victory than some had suggested, but still that victory that, uh, that we were expecting uh, going into Election Day. All right, Eric, thank you very much. And thanks for all your analysis during the campaign as well. Appreciate it. The CBC's polls analyst, Eric Grenier. Now let me thank the growing alliance of provincial governments who are champions of jobs, pipelines and our resources. Thank you especially to my friends, Premiers Mo of Saskatchewan, Pallister, Pallister of Manitoba, Ford of Ontario, Higgs of New Brunswick, and McLeod of the Northwest Territories. I, I look forward to deepening our work together to create jobs and shared prosperity. Incoming Alberta Premier Jason Kenney giving shout-outs there to his Conservative Premier counterparts. It was just one part of a rousing victory speech last night that re-signaled many of his campaign promises, a vow to fight what he calls anti-oil elements, to fight the feds on carbon taxes, and to, quote, stand up for Alberta. And as we heard off the top of the show, he's already shifting out of first gear, hoping to convene the legislature in the third week of May. The swearing-in will occur on April 30th. So what does the victory mean for Albertans, and what will it mean for the rest of Canada? It's time for the power panel. In Calgary, journalist Jen Gerson, Amanda Alvaro of Pomp and Circumstance is in Toronto, in St. John's, Suma Strategies, Tim Powers, and here with me in studio, Kathleen Monk of the Ernst Cliff Strategy Group. Hi, everybody. Hi. Nice Hi. to see you. Hi. Jen, I've got to start with you because you're right there in Alberta. What do you think people should take away from last night's uh, result? Uh, in the rest of Canada, that uh, Alberta is very keen for a fight. They're spoiling for a fight. That, that I think, would be the takeaway from, from that. Um, very clearly that uh, Jason Kenney's tone and, and po pose and rhetoric is exactly what I think a lot of Albertans uh, have been looking for from their government after 10 years of feeling as if they're kind of the heel of the rest of Canada. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the sentiment, certainly, that you get from that um, a speech. And, you know, given what we, you know, the potentially record high turnout and the high popular vote, I, I think it's a pretty overwhelming mandate to that end. And what does that mean, Kathleen, do you think? Uh, I mean, he, he mentioned off the top there other conservative premiers. The, they're, they're, they're definitely coalescing around a message, right? Yeah, for sure. It's a growing conservative uh, caucus in terms of the premiers that are literally working in a coordinated fashion, both in the media and in the courts against Trudeau. So the question is, is that a good thing for Trudeau? Is it a bad thing? And also, is it a good thing for Scheer or is it a bad thing? Because while in some ways um, Scheer is going to benefit from the fact that these conservative premiers 
are out there putting body blows into, into Trudeau almost daily, it seems. The question is, does it almost make Scheer seem weak? Because mm -hmm. clearly, it looks like Jason Kenney is taking the mantle of the Conservative leader nationally. He is that voice. He's got the pickup, he's got the Although everyone megaphone. was saying that about Doug Ford a few months ago, or six months ago. Too. Yeah, so if it's between Ford, Ford and, and Kenney, Kenney is the one with the national experience and I think will probably outperform on, on the federal stage. What do you think, Tim? Is that a fair assessment? I, I look, I think Jason Kenney, as Kathleen said, does present opportunities for Andrew Scheer if people do align and some challenges. And it wasn't Kenny. You raised, this, raised the point that Doug Ford earlier was a big voice on the stage. But I think the opportunity there for Andrew Scheer is to be slightly different than those two bigger personalities. And he is. Uh, we have certainly seen before when uh, there have been conservative prime ministers who've been able to coexist with uh, strong conservative premiers. You only need to look at Brian Mulroney and Bill Davis. Admittedly, that's uh, that's a while ago, uh, but nonetheless, it's worked before. I, I think where Andrew Scheer will find some positive is the, uh, is is in the messages that uh, Kenny and uh, and Premier Ford have used around the economy and trying to simplify uh, the bargain they're trying to make with taxpayers uh, to get their support. Um, that, that, that is where there will be some kinship, but it, there's going to be some stick handling. There's no doubt about that because there's going to come a point, I suspect, when Andrew Scheer is also going to have to step up and, and challenge some of these conservative premiers. The last thing I'd say, really interesting to hear Kenny use the word uh, alliance uh, and the yeah. fact that he is positioning himself to mm. be the leader of that alliance, it's not often that all of the conservative leaders in Canada are as aligned as they currently appear mm -hmm. to be. So you might have mm -hmm. this unique function of having an aligned series of conservative premiers, the prime mm -hmm. minister, and then Andrew Scheer, who has to dip in and mm -hmm. out from time to time. So what does that mean, Amanda? Like, like Kathleen mm -hmm. raised the question, is that a good thing or a bad thing, or is it somewhere in the middle for the prime minister and for federal liberals? Well, I think it presents an, an opportunity for the prime minister to kind of coalesce and unite that progressive vote against this right-wing populism that seems to be sweeping the country. I, too, found it interesting, both in the remarks last night, Kenny's remarks last night, where he was echoing a lot of the messages that we've seen elsewhere in the country, like open for business, like these messages as if they're being written by one conservative playbook and then piecemealed out across the country. And then today, to, use, to actually use the term alliance could set up a really nice dichotomy for the prime minister because it allows him to kind of zig while they zag or zag while they zig um, and carve out a different type of message. The challenge for the liberals will be, you know, can they supersede the NDP on that front? Can they shore up sort of a progressive movement of people who are not going to buy into things like buck a beer and tailgate parties? Um, Ontarians in particular, who I think are feeling the, the cuts, cuts to education, cuts to health care, um, who may be questioning why it was that they, they made that conservative vote in the first place. So while we might expect it in Alberta, we certainly didn't expect it in Ontario. And I think that there's some wiggle room there to bring people back over to the progressive movement with the right kind of messaging. But Vashi, can I just pick up on something Amanda said? Because I think we're seeing this emerge a little bit. We've heard some of the victories being described that conservative premiers have had as right-wing populism. I think Jen would give me that when you get 55% of the vote in Alberta, that is in right-wing populism. And I think the Liberals have to be careful using that term, too, because it can backfire on them. Blaine well, Higgs I... winning in New Brunswick was not right-wing populism. It was dissatisfaction to a large degree. And if the Liberals misdiagnose that, that cre creates an opportunity for Scheer because I think he at least realizes he's not making a populist appeal. That's well, Maxine Bernier. I, 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 would, I would actually respond to that, that. It sort of depends on what you mean by populism. Yeah. yeah if, you know, that, that's, that's what I would say. I actually probably would classify this as white, right, right wing populism because I don't think of populist as being alt right or fringe necessarily. It just to me means um, a, a kind of dissatisfaction or, or um, overthrow of the prevailing elites or. or, or rebellion against the prevailing elites like it's that kind of a movement and you know you can have left-wing populism and you can have right-wing populism and I think that definitely what Kenny was tapping into very effectively obviously was uh, that exact discontentment that anger and that right-wing populism and I think a lot of that discontentment is rooted in very legitimate 
grievances. Um, but you know, I don't. I'm, I'm coming away from this um, election uh, with a couple of takeaways. One is it's very clear to me that conservatives across this country have the momentum, and that we're going to be going into a federal election in which the main messaging coming out of the liberals right now is we're going to raise your taxes with the carbon tax, and um, the the conservatives are scary far right. You know, alt-right crazy people, and if that, if this one election should be a lesson to the to the to the federal liberals, it's that those messages that message does not actually work. It doesn't actually play that's as well point. as they think it does. Do you think that's true? I think Kathleen? that there should be some more analysis in the days. Of, I've been thinking a lot about this over lunch, and um, as I mourn today, uh, the yeah, loss I was, was going to say dark. you're, you're yeah, all in I black. I had my Notley yeah. Crew T-shirt on earlier, but I thought I'd take it off for TV. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that there should be some analysis about whether those those more you know right-wing messages, like Jen was just saying, that they're extremists, that they're fringe, might not work, and that we need to kind of go back to the hierarchy of people's needs and talk about. I, like I think both New Democrats will have more, and liberals for that matter, will have more success if they speak to the economic anxiety that the people are feeling. Do you think they made a mistake in this campaign not switching to that? I think that this was the most successful new democratic campaign that has ever been run period across the country and and Ooh. that I compare Except that Except for 2015? No, I, no, I even compare that with 2011. Like I mean the which which I was involved in. I was oh. involved in with 2015, but but in terms of it was flawless. They had no unforced errors. They they didn't lose any candidates. In fact, they took down many candidates of of the opposing team. Um this mm. you have to remember that this government in the last 4 years, precipitous drop in oil thousands, historic job losses, such churn, the Fort Mac fires, you name it, right? And they and they still really held on to a significant number of seats. We have to look now, basically in Ontario and westward, either New Democrats are government, as they are in BC, or they are the leading opposition in all of those provinces. I this take is, your point, is, and I know a, it is, a, I, I, especially in Alberta, but I, think, I feel oh like gosh. I feel like people would be a little bit, hard, it's a, hard, a little bit hard to swallow considering they lost. I, <laughs> sure, I, I, but, I, I actually but would have But look what they have done, but what have they done in terms of, I'll get if you I could just finish, just for yeah, a second, yeah, of course. just look at where they were prior to the election. Look at how they closed, how they actually closed the gap to what the prediction went. Let's all remember, Jason, no, let's remember Jason Kenney himself, Jason Kenney himself, I am going to change the map in Edmonton. I'm going to sweep Edmonton. Sorry, Jason, where are those seats? Like, they, the everywhere Democrats held. Well, everywhere, everywhere else in the else province. In the yeah, province. for sure. <laughs> but if you want me to look at the bright lights, these are, these are yeah. them. He didn't make those inroads. And in fact, the New Democrats were able to change the campaign narrative to one of trust and leadership no, they and around values. They completely that, failed to do that. No, well, I mean, where you're wrong. Let her finish and then I'll get Jen. I'll get it, Jen. The economy and the anxiety, and I led with that, Jen. But the thing is, if you look where they were in the polls prior to this campaign, and how they close the gap within the, the campaign window, all the trend lines uh, show that they shortened that distance. And they actually held on to many more seats as a result. Okay, Jen's turn. Yeah, Kathleen, I would agree with you on a couple of basic fundamental points here, and that is the economics being what they were and the electoral math being what it was. The odds of, and, and just the lead that UCP came into this exactly. um, election with, were so extraordinary that, you know, not only would it, was it, would it have to have been a flawless campaign, it would have had to have been a perfect campaign for them to have, have, have won. I mean, this was a massive uphill battle, and there probably wasn't much that they could do. That being said, the idea that this was the best NDP campaign in Canadian history, I would take pretty considerable issue with that. I think that the NDP fundamentally failed to appeal to centrist voters. I think they fundamentally uh, um, failed in their messaging about their economic plan, and I think that they massively over-relied on bozo eruptions. They massively over-relied on this idea that if we can just paint the other guys as racist and bigots, that that, that will just take care of the rest of it. Um, and obviously, obviously, just judging by the turnout, the organization of this party had failed. So, like, I actually think that you're quite right in that. How can you see the organization for the, in terms of door knocks? They, they, they doubled it. Because they, because they lost. The money. They lost dramatically. Okay. I mean, I mean, this here's, is a here's, party here's, that here's, prior here's, to going... Let her finish. Let her finish. Hold on. It's my turn to please. Please let me finish. <laughs> I would say I agree with you that they're in actually a very, very strong position. I mean, if they had, they had gotten this result four years ago, they would be ecstatic. They broke out of Edmonton. They've made some headway in places like Calgary and Lethbridge, and they are in a really, really strong place to build from where they are. But if they don't realize that this was a setback and that they have considerable building to do, 
then they are never going to get to the place where oh they my. can be a competitive, progressive alternative. Okay. Very quick point, oh Kathleen, I have to of, take a break. Of course they realize it was a setback. They're no longer government. <laughs> that said, if we have to find what the benefits were, like, listen, they have cabinet ministers who are now going to be opposition who are going to be able to hold Kenny to account on education, on finance, on health, on justice. And they will be able to know and, and to prevent him as best, much as they can from rolling back the things that Albertans actually want, things like reducing child poverty by half, things like diversifying the economy, which hasn't been done. After four decades of conservative I, rule leading up to 2015, this is significant. It's I, not a win. I, I agree. I'm not, I've got rose-colored glasses on or orange for that matter. I know they didn't win last night, but I still think that there are good things about this campaign.